Okay, so we're just waiting on people arriving. Thank you for joining us this evening um, for this uh, BBA webinar uh, during VNAM, Veterinary Nurse Awareness Month. Um, so the numbers are going up. This is fantastic. We're not talking to ourselves, Helen. This is good. good. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know. Um, while we're just waiting on other people arriving, um, if you could just let everybody know about our second part to this series. Um, we're doing a second webinar for Pet Blood Bank, which is catering more for the general public um, to obviously try and get more donators and uh, donors in for our uh, sessions. And that's on the 27th of May. So if everybody could let the general public of the own dogs know about this seminar, that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, and then we can let everybody know how they, they can take their dogs to donate. And, but tonight is obviously more about the vet nurse side, about the veterinary profession, et cetera. So we're just waiting on some more numbers and then we'll get started. Right. Oh, I've got quite a few now. Okay. Okay, so we're ready to start. So my name is Nikki McLeod. I am BDNA Regional Representative for Glasgow and Central Scotland. Thank you all for coming this evening to this webinar. During VNAM, we are looking to promote the work of the veterinary nursing profession, and nothing shows more what vet nurses can do than the Pet Blood Bank. Having worked for them for two years now, I really wanted to show the veterinary profession nursing profession, what a huge part RVNs play at PBB. We've got Wendy Barnett, she's the founder and the clinical director of Pet Blood Bank, she's an advanced diploma qualified veterinary nurse. We've got our managing director, Katrina, she's a veterinary nurse. We've got the veterinary manager, Caroline, registered veterinary nurse. Myself as an RVN and regional coordinator for Scotland, as well as a phlebotomist for PBB. And all the phlebotomists that take blood for PBB are registered veterinary nurses. And then we also have Helen, who is a degree in advanced diploma qualified registered veterinary nurse and her position with Pet Blood Bank UK is training and induction manager and she's our speaker for this evening. Helen qualified as a veterinary nurse in 1996 and worked in referral practice as a veterinary nursing lecturer. She immediately developed an interest in emergency critical care and transfusion medicine, enjoying the fast pace and intense nursing input of these cases. She loved the visible and profound transformation of some patients following a transfusion and believes it to be a great area to be nurse led. She now currently works one day a week for Vets Now in the role of Vets Now clinical support to the hospitals and four days a week as the training and induction manager for PVB. So it's over to you, Helen. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, I, I feel very privileged to do this, uh, this webinar. And as, as Nikki has said, I think there are few organizations that can really showcase the diversity of roles um, that, that Pet Blood Bank uh, can and all those opportunities for, for veterinary nurses out there. Because um, we know we can do everything, but uh, this, this will definitely show you. Uh, so this is just an overview of, of what I want to talk about. So just a little bit of background to start off with about Pet Blood Bank, and then uh, a bit about our donors and then how we can work together um, and how you can, can work with Pet, and, uh, Pet Blood Bank. And then a little bit about some of the lesser well-known um, services that Pet Blood Bank offer as well. So that's, that's where we're gonna go. So we're in our 14th year at the moment uh, and we are a not-for-profit charity. Um, and the charity was set up by emergency clinicians working for vets now in the out of hours um, service because they were seeing patients coming in out of hours that needed blood products and um, I'm sure you know you've, you've been there yourself I certainly have before pet blood bank launch where you're ringing owners at, at horrendous o'clock in the morning trying to find a dog or trying to get a staff dog in that you could that you could bleed to provide these products so they found there was a real need for, for having a better way of, of supporting these emergency patients. So Pet Blood Bank was, was set up. And as Nikki said, one of the founders uh, of Pet Blood Bank is, is Wendy, who is a, a veterinary nurse. Um, and the aim of Pet Blood Bank was, was twofold, really. One is to, to um, supply the profession with, with blood products um, very quickly uh, and conveniently. 
And then second is to uh, educate and uh, promote transfusion medicine in the profession. Um, the original model was very similar to the NHS blood transfusion service. So the idea behind Pet Blood Bank is that it's a voluntary scheme in that the owners volunteer their dogs to come along to sessions to be blood donors. And then that collected blood then goes to our processing laboratory based in Loughborough. And we then separate it out and manufacture the different components that we then supply to, to you. Um, each of our donors donates a single unit and that unit we can separate into four different blood products, each with different properties. So there's a potential for that one donor dog to save the lives of, of up to four um, dogs in, in practice. Uh, so we have at the moment a, about 5,000 active donors registered. Now, since 2007, uh, we've had more than 5,000 donors in total register across all the years, but we lose donors continuously pretty much. They, they can't donate after their ninth birthday. So as they age, they then have to be retired as a donor. If they develop a, a, a medical condition that requires medicine, they are retired. So, so we're continuously losing donors. So in order to build our donor database, we need a lot of new donor registration. So I know 5,000 probably sounds like a lot, uh, but it isn't. The demand for blood is continuously increasing. So we need to recruit more, more and more donors in order to be able to, to continue to supply uh, practices. So we, we separated Britain out into different regions. So we have uh, Scotland, yay. We have the Northwest, the Northeast, the Midlands, and then the Southeast and the Southwest. And we run sessions during the week, uh, mostly in the Midlands and sometimes in some of the other regions. Uh, and then at weekend, we generally have four, up to four sessions running in the different regions. Um, last year we collected over 3,000 units of blood and then we separated that and processed it into 5,000 products which we supplied to, to veterinary practices. Uh, and I'm sure you're aware already, our service is 24 hours, so you can order blood uh, at any time and it will be uh, dispatched to you. Uh, and, and our products are used to treat lots of, of conditions. So patients that have suffered hemorrhage due to a traumatic injury or a surgical procedure and they've, they've lost blood, medical conditions such as anemia, um, patients that have coagulopathies, um, septic patients that are kind of pouring albumin out into their abdomen, uh, parvo puppies that have really hemorrhagic diarrhea that are becoming anemic that way. There's a, there's a huge range of, of uh, conditions that can be uh, managed and supported with the, the products that we make, but I'm sure you, you know that already. Uh, and then we couldn't talk about Pet Blood Bank without talking about our wonderful donors. So our criteria for donors is that they are fit, healthy adults. So between one and eight, they can't donate after they turn nine. They must weigh more than 25 kilos. And this is because we take a fixed volume from every donor. Uh, and so we need them to be 25 kilos or bigger in order for that volume to be safe for them to donate. Uh, we're looking for bouncy, confident dogs. Uh, and, and, and I think you guys are perfectly placed uh, to identify these donors out in practice when you come across them, these big dogs, they're pulling their owners through the door, they're wagging their tails, they're happy to be there, they're not worried. Uh, obviously it might not be their favorite place in the world, but they're, they're confident and they're quite relaxed in a veterinary environment with you guys. Uh, they need a good temperament. We don't use any chemical restraints and we don't muzzle our donors. So they have to have a nice friendly temperament as well. Um, the donors must have been born in the UK or Ireland, so they can't be imported dogs uh, because of the risk of any uh, infectious diseases coming in the blood from other countries. 
uh, and they can't have traveled outside the UK or Ireland either. They can live with a travel dog or an imported dog, but the donor itself uh, must have remained in the UK all its life. Um, ideally up to date with all their vaccinations um, and not on any current medication. So, so those are the donors that we're looking for um, and hopefully you can help us to, to identify those dogs and to encourage their donors to their owners to register them. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, so what is the process? Because if you're going to talk to these donor owners or these dog owners about pet blood bank and, and the possibility of dog donating, they're going to want to know what that involves. So they get given an appointment time. It's just the same as if they were coming to see the vet. Um, and the way we set up a venue, we try and have three different areas. So our first area is called pre-screen and the dog will spend maybe 10 minutes in here and our veterinary surgeon is in there with a donor assistant usually and the dog comes in and gets lots of fuss and treats. Um, they do a, a health check um, to make sure that everything is okay. They talk to the owner about the dog's history since it last came or its complete history if it's the first time we've seen it. Um, they clip up the jugular and they apply local anaesthetic ready for them to move through into donation uh, and they take a little bit of blood to run a PCV total solids on the day so that we can make sure that they're not anemic and they're not dehydrated before they donate um, and sometimes we take a little bit more blood because there are other screens that we that we carry out to make sure the donor is is healthy so if once they've finished in pre-screen they then move into the donation room. So we usually have a second consulting room set up as our donation room if we if we have the room at the venue. Uh, and in here, they again, they come in, they get fussed, they get treats. Uh, they're led on a, a big mattress on the table. They are lightly held by uh, our donation team and then our phlebotomists take the donation and our phlebotomists are all um, RVNs. Uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that again at the end. So it takes about between five and 10 minutes to get our full donation, which is 450 mils. Uh, and then the donor has a neck bandage placed. Um, and then they move through into the final area, which is what we call post donation. Um, so in there, they get more treats and more fuss. They have their photograph taken and that goes onto our Facebook site. Um, and they're given um, their, their, their goodie bag to go home with. So every dog that comes to a session goes home with a goodie bag with treats. And then we have a big crate of toys, uh, big dog toys that they get to pick, uh, they get to pick from. So that's our post donation area and they stay there varying lengths of time really. Um, new donors, we tend to keep a little bit longer just to make sure that they, they tolerate the donation okay. This is all a little bit different at the moment because of the pandemic uh, restrictions that we're operating under. So it's, it's slightly different, but uh, um, this is kind of the, the, the main way we operate. Um, and under normal circumstances, our owners are allowed to accompany their dogs right the way through. It's very transparent what we do. <clears throat> and our donor welfare is at the heart of everything that, that Pet Blood Bank do. Um, their welfare is prioritized over a successful unit. We'd rather protect our donor than, than get that unit. What we're looking for are these dogs to donate, you know, for years and years and years um, and although we'd like the unit on that day protecting that dog and, and hopefully uh, getting it back uh, for repeat donations is is really important to us so uh, we we watch their behavior very closely looking for any signs that they are anxious hopefully they're quite relaxed and, and comfortable um, we score them on compliance um, welfare and anatomy uh, and we monitor those scores because what we don't want is a, a, a donor to kind of uh, start to their scores to decline because they are becoming more anxious. 
uh, with the process. So we track those um, and we use them sometimes, you know, if, uh, if it looks like a donor's, um, you know, not, not enjoying or, or not as comfortable with the process as it was, then we retire them. Um, we don't use any chemical restraints at all. It's all done on um, positive engagement with the donors, treats, fuss, um, and their kind of willing participation. Um, we do put local anaesthetic cream on so that that minimizes the, the feeling of the needle being placed. And then it's just a case of, of them lying there, uh, having their tummy tickled while the, the donation is, is taken. Uh, and we like to recognize uh, our donors uh, milestone donations. So they get the, the treat bag and the toy every time they come. And then they get additional uh, uh, gifts from Pet Blood Bank uh, as they hit those milestone donations there. So the dog pictured there is Stumpy and he retired, I think maybe last year, uh, recently, maybe the year before. Um, and he'd done 30 donations. So he was one of our highest donating uh, dogs. So they get those gifts uh, when they hit those milestone donations. They also get little badges, like what you would get if you went to kind of cubs or brownies or guides, so little badges that get sewn onto the, uh, the bandana by some of their owners. So the owners are, are, are very, uh, very gift uh, focused. Uh, so I just wanted to, to show you a, a little, a couple of little video clips just um, to show you how important these blood products are to, to our patients. And I'm sure you will have seen similar dogs in practice. So this is Susie. Susie is a, um, a Labradoodle. So at the time this video was taken, she was seven months old. Um, and this was the first time I met Susie. I, I opened her cage door to get her out to do a procedure and she kind of stepped out and then just led, led down. So she, she had hemolytic anemia. Uh, so this is a just little video of, of uh, Susie uh, when, I, when I met her. She's just like, totally. <laughs> she just kind of gave me a little bit of an eyeball and then was like, I just haven't got the energy. I'm not interested. Um, so this was Susie pre-transfusion. So we gave Susie some uh, Pet Blood Bank packed red cells. And then this is the video. This is immediately post-transfusion. I disconnected the blood and took her straight out for a week because she'd been there for four hours having the transfusion. And this is her after the blood had been given. Right, Susie. So for me, blood products are one of very few interventions where you can, you know, you can see that profound uh, change in your patients um, after they've had the, uh, the transfusion. Um, and and, and I, I love that. I think transfusion is very nursing uh, focused. Uh, so in terms of working together, uh, there are ways that you can support Pet Blood Bank um, and there are certainly plenty of roles within Pet Blood Bank for, for veterinary nurses. So as I said before, veterinary nurses are, are, are perfect uh, to be identifying those blood donors or potential blood donors in practice when they come through the door. Um, so help us by spreading the word, by putting posters up in your waiting room, uh, leaflets when you're allowed leaflets on display to give to clients. Um, if you see a suitable dog come bouncing through the door that you think might meet our criteria, then just mention it to the owner. Um, you know, have you ever thought about allowing Monty to be a blood donor? I think he'd be great. Um, and then just talk to them about Pet Blood Bank and, and the donation process. 
Uh, it may be that you can hand out leaflets at some of your routine nursing appointments. So some of your, your vaccinations maybe, or your neuter checks, post-op checks, worm checks, that sort of thing. Um, again, it's another opportunity for, for veterinary nurses to engage with, with the clients. Um, we are a charity. Um, uh, so we're always grateful of any fundraising that anybody can do. Um, if you do any fundraising, make sure you tell us uh, so that we can share it on our Facebook. And we also have, a, have an annual competition called the Heart of Pet Blood Bank. And we do um, a, a specific award for, for fundraising for our practices that fundraise. We also have a 5K May challenge at the moment. So if you're on Facebook, if you follow us on Facebook, uh, that would be great. And the information of, on the challenges is on our website. Um, I've done it. I don't know, Nikki, have you done your 5K May? Are you there? Yes, I did it on the 5th of May, which was yeah. my little boy's birthday. So Very yeah. Good. Yeah, fantastic. Um, uh, and, and yeah, just encourage uh, people to register their dogs as donors so they can do it very easily they go to our website and if you see there on the right hand side there is a, a tab that says register your dog and then they just put in the details and they'll be contacted by our donor admin team who talk through uh, a lot more about the process and also dig a little deeper into the uh, the character and and the, uh, the history of the dog um, there are certain breeds that we are always, always on the lookout for. And those are listed on the slide there. Uh, and that's because they tend to have um, a negative blood type, which um, only 30% of our donors are, have negative blood type. Um, and it's, it's a, a very high demand uh, product. Uh, so we're always looking for for those particular breeds of dog to register. Uh, and, and then, uh, as Nikki's uh, mentioned, there are uh, a lot of roles within Pet Blood Bank that are filled or could be filled by um, a veterinary nurse. So we have our clinical roles in the region. So all our phlebotomists are registered veterinary nurses. Um, our donor assistants can be student nurses or registered nurses. Uh, and then we have our regional coordinator role, which can be filled by a registered veterinary nurse or a student veterinary nurse um, that knows the local area. Um, and, and I'm sure Nikki can talk more about um, what's involved with that, that particular role. Other roles within Pet Blood Bank that are currently occupied by veterinary nurses or could certainly be, uh, be done by a veterinary nurse are the veterinary manager, uh, the training and induction manager, but that's my role, so you can't have that one. <laughs> Clinical director, uh, so that is Wendy, who was one of the founders of Pet Blood Bank. Our managing director is a veterinary nurse. Um, our donor admin team, there are several of them that each have different roles. Some of them look after our host venues. Some of them look after the donors after they donate and kind of do all the follow up and speak to the vets about blood results and that sort of thing. The supervisor that manages the, the donor team, um, they can all be filled by uh, student or registered veterinary nurses. Our laboratory processes, uh, can be registered or student veterinary nurses if you want to uh, to you like working in the lab and and you find kind of that attention to detail and following a process um, very interesting and then our distribution team again could be filled by student and veterinary or a, a registered veterinary nurse and they speak to the customers they take the orders they put the orders together, they liaise with the couriers, they manage the accounts um, and that side of things. Um, they do a lot of advice giving, they visit practices when they're allowed um, to kind of uh, support the practice. 
Um, the feline project manager, we don't have at the moment, um, but we will be looking to fill that position in the future. And again, that, that is a, a perfect role for a, a registered veterinary nurse that likes cats, <laughs> a crazy cat nurse. Um, our out of hours team uh, could be student or veterinary nurses. Uh, so they are the people that are on call in effect on a rotor basis to manage those emergency blood orders that come in once the, uh, the centre has closed. Uh, and then our quality administrator role is somebody that looks after all our, our documents. They investigate uh, our non-conformances um, and kind of maintain the quality side of, of what we do. And again, that role could be filled by a student or veterinary nurse. So there's a, a massive range um, of very clinical, very hands-on roles with, with either donors or with, with blood products to very customer focused roles, right through to administrative roles. So there's, there's pretty much something for everybody there except training and induction. <laughs> Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to end by um, just explaining some of the services that, that people don't actually know that we do. A lot of people, if they know about Pet Blood Bank, they know we supply blood products. Um, but these services are, are other things that we do, and we do them because we want to support you guys in practice carrying out your transfusions. So we do an alpaca processing service. Uh, so we... We do go out to farms sometimes and collect uh, blood from alpacas, but usually the practice, uh, the veterinary practice that deals with that alpaca farm does the collecting and then we just do the processing and we separate it into plasma, which is antibody rich. And that is transfused to little baby alpaca, Crea, um, um, that are uh, deficient in immunoglobulins, which is a, an alpaca thing, apparently. And then we have a transfusion advice service. It's completely free. So if your vet is scratching their head about a, a transfusion case, it's complicated, or they're just not sure what to do or where to go, they can go to our website, they click on the transfusion advice service, they open a ticket, they put in their questions, they can attach blood results if they want to. And that goes off to one of our specialist uh, transfusion specialist, and they then will reply with their um, expert opinion. Um, and they do that in whatever time frame you need it. You can flag it up as super, super urgent, or you can just say, you know what, you know, this is not urgent. When you get the chance, can you come back to me? But they're usually very quick. They usually reply within within a matter of hours. Uh, we do a canine cross matching service. Um, so if you have a, if you're coming up to the third transfusion of a, of a dog um, or any more than three, um, then trying to find a compatible unit can be really very difficult. Once they've been exposed to those different, uh, the different blood from different dogs, they become sensitized to, to lots of different antigens. So finding a compatible unit is tricky. Uh, so what you do is you send your uh, recipients blood to IDEX. We send blood from six of our units to IDEX and they will cross match them and then pull up a report of which is the most compatible for your for your dog so that you're really reducing any transfusion reaction risk. Uh, not necessary for your first time or probably not your second time with dogs uh, but as you get to kind of three or more transfusion the risk of a reaction uh, goes up quite considerably. Um, and then last but not least, we have a blood sharing scheme. So we have practices around the country that hold our blood products on site um, and you can contact them. They're 24 hour hospitals. You can contact them day or night. Uh, they're just down the road and say, we need a unit of positive pat red cells um, and they can ship it in a taxi or someone can go and get it or the owner can go and get it and bring it to you. Um, and all you do is you go on the, our website, you go to the blood sharing scheme, put your postcode in, and it will bring up all the practices that are in your area that, that hold our blood products. So that's just another service that people perhaps don't, um, don't know. Um, and then I just wanted to mention our CPD programme. So we have a, 
quite a considerable webinar bank. These are on-demand free webinars. They're all transfusion related and several of them are focused at veterinary nurses and the veterinary nurses role in transfusion medicine. And they can be found on our, on our website. You just go to the CPD area um, and there's a big long list of specialist delivered webinars that you can just pick whenever you want, click and, and watch. And in March, 2022, we will have um, a nursing certificate in transfusion medicine that we're creating with Improve International. So if you feel like transfusion medicine is for you, it's something that you're interested in. Um, and I personally think that it is a very, very nurse role where you can really kind of lead and take control, um, then you can register on that to, to learn more. And then just to finish, um, we're also going to be looking at starting up our feline service. We were hoping that it would be ready already, uh, but the pandemic, as it has for a lot of, of things, it has kind of stopped that process from progressing, uh, but it's still coming. We're still doing it. We have about 90 cats uh, registered um, at the moment. So again, um, owners register their cats through the website if they meet, uh, meet our criteria, which are also on our website. Uh, and we'll soon be able to provide you with platelets. Um, and that is going to happen this year. You heard it here. Uh, and finishing with our amazing donors. Uh, and uh, Nikki, you can come back. I'm finished. Brilliant. Thank you, Helen. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, as a low stress, qualified and fair free nurse, myself i just love the fact that pet blood bank is very much about the dog's discretion and um, we're not pinning these dogs down we are letting the dog decide if it wants to donate and so many dogs turn up and actually fall asleep on the table which is a good sign for us and as a crazy cat nurse myself uh, i yeah. love to hear about the feeling side of that as well so that was absolutely fantastic too yeah, well, we so yeah we do have some people well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we know we know lots of them. So yeah, we have got some questions coming in. Wow. Um, Abby, Abby has asked, um, I work at the University of Ghent in Belgium and our nurse team is responsible for the blood bank at our clinic. All our blood and plasma products are used in house and we do not sell them to other clinics. How do you explain it to your donors that you charge for blood? Our donors know that it's just for our hospital, but a lot of potential donors do not want to donate because they think we should, they, we should sell it to other vet practices and because the university is the only blood bank in Belgium. Yeah, okay, good question. Um, I think Pet Blood Bank is not attached to a university, so we were not affiliated with, with any. We don't have patients in-house that we use. It's a completely independent organisation. Um, and we have an agreement with all the practices that we supply blood to that they don't put any markup on that blood and they pass it to yeah. the client at the same price mm -hmm. it costs us. And we sell it, um, we actually subsidize. Um, so all the fundraising that we do and the money that comes into the charity, we use to reduce the price of those blood products. So we try and keep it as low as we can, but obviously we have to cover wages and equipment and consumables. So we're not in it to make money. We're a not-for-profit charity and everything that comes in, it goes straight back into to our blood products. Um, and we also yeah. supply blood products free to veterinary charities. So the RSPCA, PDSA, other veterinary charities, we supply them with blood free of charge so that even, you know, even people perhaps who are quite financially constrained still have the same opportunities as, as other people mm -hmm. for their dogs to have that treatment. So um, uh, I, I think it's a, it is a bit of a tricky area, but um, yeah. Uh, we, uh, we just want to maximise the amount of dogs that can benefit from what we do. And, and the ultimate aim of the charity is to supply it for free. If we could fundraise mm -hmm. enough to cover our costs, we would absolutely be giving it away. And that's what, we yeah. will, that's what we're aiming for. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. Um, another question is, how often can dogs donate? 
So our donors don't donate uh, any more regularly than two monthly. So that's the maximum. They can physically donate more often than that, but Pet Blood Bank has a, a, a two month maximum rule. Again, because the, their, the welfare of our donors is, is, you know, more important than anything. Excellent, absolutely. Um, another question, uh, where can I find a list of local donation places? So I think if you go onto our website as an, a pet owner, you can put in your postcode and look for, it will give you a, a list of, of venues, donation venues that are close to you. Mm -hmm. I would say if you go on our website, you put your postcode in and you can't find anywhere close to you, we need your practice. Exactly. That, is a, that is a blind spot and we mm -hmm. want donors, we need you. Yeah. And that is, as you say, one of my jobs is to find new venues in the area. Um, and I mean, at the moment, the Scottish team are out almost every weekend, some sessions during the week. So, yeah, if your practice is interested, you just give us a shout. Absolutely. Uh, another question is, are there opportunities for potential donors that are not at the year, end, the year mark to come and have training or experience at a session before coming to donate? Yeah, now, I don't know what you think about this, Nikki. It's, it's a, it is a tricky one. We have thought about it and we've talked about it. Um, but to do that, we would have to take up a slot that mm -hmm. a donor would use to have a dog come along and kind of go through the motions. So it's, it is a tricky one. There are things that you can do at home to... Um, to familiarise them with the process that they're going to go through. Um, and the more they go to their veterinary practice, even if it's just to walk in and go on the scales and have a fuss and mm -hmm. walk out again, yep. that will help. Absolutely. Um, but so, do you have any donors in, in the Scotland sessions, Nikki, that, that kind of do that? I know sometimes they'll bring the other dog, if they have two, yeah. and one of them's a bit younger, they bring yeah. their pal in and, and they get a look around. So we do that. Of course, in COVID times, it is difficult at the moment, but certainly um, we, we have quite busy sessions. We're up to between 15 to 20, sometimes more um, donors at a session. It's a long day. Um, and as you say, it can be difficult then to say, yeah, it's just come along through with your dog when we're already a very busy team and taking blood. That is obviously the most important thing. But hopefully post-COVID, once we get people back in the waiting rooms, et cetera, there's no harm in them coming down, putting them on the scales, etc. And as you say, we have training leaflets that we can um, give out, that we, you can practice. You have things like using an electric toothbrush where you get them used to the sound of the clippers, um, practicing laying your dog down. A lot of people don't realise that the dog goes straight into lateral recumbency when they are uh, getting a donation. A lot of dogs aren't used to that. They don't go to the vet and lie straight on their sides on the table if they're on a table at all. So getting the owners to learn how to do that would help us an absolute treat. Um, but hopefully post-COVID, yeah, we might be able to get people back in the waiting room and get them on the scale, get their dogs on the scales, etc. I think that the issues that we probably have most with, or the donors probably have most with, is, as you say, the, the clippers being shaved, the noise, the feel um is, is mm -hmm. something that creates some anxiety and then yeah lifting you know a 25 kilo dog in its life never gets lifted off the floor nobody carries them around um you know like your small exactly. dog. So they get lifted up in the air which is completely and utterly ah, alien to them um and like exactly. so so those sort of things you don't have to be at a session to do um if the dog is used to those things then it is less unfamiliar uh, when they come to donate. Exactly. Another question we've got is, if the donor doesn't donate a full unit, can you still use that blood that is collected? Yeah, yes, we can. We use all the blood. Um, so we aim for a full unit, but there are smaller volumes that we can still process into blood products. Um, but obviously, we're always trying to get the full unit because we can make everything from that. But a smaller volume, we would just make what we could make from that. Um, so, yes, we use everything. Every drop counts in some way or form. Very valuable resource, yes. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, another question yeah, we have. Thanks for all of these questions. They're fantastic. Oh, you sorry. The next question, Nikki. That our phlebotomists uh -huh. they get full units. So Nikki, full units. We don't. We don't do. We don't do less. Full units. Less. They get full <laughs> units. <laughs> we try. We try. <laughs> Um, and last question we have here, which anaesthetic cream do you use and at what point in the session do you apply it? So at the moment we use Emla um, and we put it on as the dog goes into pre-screen, it's literally the first thing that happens. Um, you know, hello, hi, treat, clip, Emla, straight away so that we've got yeah. the maximum amount of time for it to be, uh, to be effective. Um, we are looking at maybe trying another product called LMX4, which is a lidocaine based uh, local <laughs> anaesthetic, but it is a slightly different preparation that is possibly a little bit more fast action. So we're going to have a look at that uh, and do a little trial with it. But but we use Emla and, and to be honest, it I know you're supposed to leave it on for, for 40 minutes, an hour. It seems to do the job, doesn't it, Nikki? It does, yeah. But when you think about it as well, as you say, if you're doing it, the first thing that you do when the dog gets into the room, you then have a full health check, you then have to take bloods to do PCV, total solids, etc. There, there is time for it to work. And then by the time they then come through to us in the donation room, we've got to get cuddles and treats and stuff. They're not just going straight onto the table. Um, the phlebotomist has to look through the paperwork. There's a lot to do. So the time is ticking. So by the time they actually get onto the table and we get them uh, pre prepared for the donation, it definitely does seem to work in the majority of cases. And as I say, a lot of the dogs even fall asleep and they don't even feel the needle going in. So it's it does work. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know about human blood donors. Do, do they, I think some of them donate without any amla um at all they just i've ne i've never had them laugh no yeah, they just, they <laughs> just, just do it straight in <laughs> straight in there <laughs> so yeah we're actually even kinder <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um for can i ask a question for those that are interested in becoming a uh, phlebotomist can i ask about the training what is the training um structure to our, an rbn that is interested in being a phlebotomist mm, okay so we do, uh, there's two parts to the training. There's the theory element. So that is completion of some online courses on our e-learning platform, which is called Learn Dash. So you get a login uh, for that. And there are courses set up in there that go through the phlebotomy training and the SOPs, a little bit about backgrounds about Pet Blood Bank um, as well in there. So there's the theory side of things. And then there's the practical on session training. So what I would say is if you're, if you think it might be something that you're interested in doing, you can contact Nikki um, and go to a, a session, just spend a few hours there, just a shadowing role, see how it goes, watch what the phlebotomists do, get an idea uh, if it is actually something for you. Um, and then we can sort you out with the theory training and then you do a minimum of three practical shifts working alongside a trained phlebotomist. Um, some phlebotomists, we do four or more, but usually um, three three or four is, is enough. Um, so you, uh, you have that practical training as well. And I think it is incredibly rewarding, isn't it? Incredibly rewarding to come yes. away from a session thinking mm -hmm. there are 15 units of blood on the way back to Loughborough. You know, that's 15 that's times four <laughs> products made. Mm -hmm. um, it's very satisfying. Mm -hmm. And all the people that you meet are just lovely. The donor owners, amazing. So enthusiastic, lovely people, lovely dogs, mm -hmm. uh, great teams. Uh, it's uh, a great a great place and a very satisfying job isn't it Nikki I bet you because you do loads I bet you it is. just yeah beaming it's, so I think for for me it's as a veterinary nurse you tend to see a lot of sick animals whereas with the pet blood bank they're all fit healthy dogs nine times out of ten they're so happy to see you because they know they're going to get all these treats and it is it's just a lovely experience and it's 
a really nice side to norm, normal veterinary nursing. Um, it's just a really nice day out. It's busy. It can, it can be a long day, but it is, as you say, very, very rewarding. And I would highly recommend it to any RVN that is interested. Yeah, so we'll just check, see if there's any more questions. Thank you for a great webinar. Uh, thanks, Abby, that's fantastic. Oh, here's another question just come in. Do you have to be qualified a minimum amount of time in order to work in this area? So if you wanted to work as a donor assistant role, um, and I quite like the DA role, actually, um, because that's, you know, the, the phlebotomist has the paperwork to do. They have a spreadsheet to fill in. They do the collecting. The DAs, they do the cuddling uh, and the stroking and the tickling <laughs> and check pulse, mucous membranes, bandage on, lots of fuss and, and stuff. So I really enjoy that role. To do that role, you don't have to be an RBN. To be a phlebotomist, you do have to be an RVN. And, and we don't have a specific time frame, but I think you, um, you just want to build up your confidence dealing with clients, with dogs, um, because outside of COVID times, our phlebotomists are collecting this blood with the owner standing right there. Um, mm -hmm. So you've got to have that confidence in yourself um, to be able to talk to the owner, you know, watch the dog, monitor that, you know, and do your donation at the same time. So I would say, you know, you want to kind of have a good year in practice, but we do have some um, phlebotomists that started out as DAs. They know what we do. They know the process and they've qualified and gone straight into phlebotomy. And you, Chelsea's one of those, isn't she, Nikki? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. It's, it, it is a lot of the time is it's not necessarily that actual needle putting in that's the the difficult job it's trying to do that and think what you're doing and talk to the client and watch the days so yes there is a lot of um things to think about um but yeah I, the best thing to do is just go to the website say that you're interested and get in contact with us and we can see what happens um there's another question here uh, are these positions voluntary no no they're not we we pay you we do have a voluntary role which is a like a, a greeter if you like on the session so our actual unpaid volunteers they come to the sessions they greet the donors and the owners they check the paperwork's filled in they weigh the dogs they watch the dogs in post donation they do the photos uh, and they just chat to the owners really they do refreshments uh, just make sure that the that the owners are comfortable um, so that is a voluntary role and we do have we do have people clinical people that that do this voluntarily but we don't expect you to it is a paid position absolutely and it's a nice bonus <laughs> at the end of the day when because you are doing a, a really worthwhile job um, but certainly when I find out about it I just wanted to volunteer as a donor assistant I didn't realize that you actually got paid for it so yes it is actually quite a nice bonus to be paid um and it's a stressful enough job as it is being the phlebotomist so yeah it's quite nice to be paid for that um so let's see if we have any more questions uh are these roles full-time or just called on as and when needed so the clinical roles the DA and the phlebotomist are um they are they're not full-time roles and you're not bound to any set number of hours. I think we, we you probably know more about that side of things, Nikki, is, is kind of the expectation regarding shift mm -hmm. numbers. Um, basically, it depends on how many sessions there are in the area and it depends on how many there are in the team. So, for example, with a Scottish team, I've got over 40 people, um, vets, nurses and DAs. And as I say, a session normally every weekend. So, and we do want to be fair to everybody. And the reason we also want to be fair is that we don't want you to do one session in January and then not do another session till November, December time. And we don't want your skills to, to, to slack. So try to, that's part of my job as a regional coordinator is to share the, the shifts out as much as possible. But uh, certainly the way I work is I give the dates out, the venues out, and you put forward what dates and venues like to do, and then I share them out. So you're not committing to a particular 
shift every single time. But we do ask you to obviously not make too much of a gap in the middle. So you're always keeping on top. And we like the fact that we're all a team and we all get to know each other and we all get to know the owners as well. So it's nice to we try to, I certainly always try to keep it the same people as much as possible for a certain venue. So then the owners begin to ask for certain people and, oh, it's nice to see you and, oh, it's so good that you're on. But everybody says it's just such a fun uh, session to be at that it's 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 good fun for the owners and the clients. And post-COVID, hopefully we'll get the owners back in and you get to have a good rapport with the owners. And yeah, so that it's not full time and it's as much as you little as you like, but you do commit to a certain number of shifts each year. And it's nice to get to know the donors. Um, you know, you get to know, we do have some, probably mostly Labradors, who you know, you don't do the whole, yay, let's all get excited and give you loads of treats before you put, go on the table. You know, you kind of learn and you think, yeah, yeah we'll do the treats and the fuss afterwards. We keep it quite low key. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Nobody do much talking, do the donation. Yes, it just goes crazy after that. And then, uh, so you get to know and, and how to manage those which is is good yeah and it's funny because again the, the donors that have been so often actually know the scenario that they know when you hear that click of the the um blood being stopped oh that's it done and they're awake they're they're with it whereas before they're just like i'm going to sit here for 10 minutes five minutes how long it takes and they're perfectly happy so it's it's such a good atmosphere for the dogs and the owners, certainly pre-COVID, when they came in and they were like so interested in seeing how the, the, the actual scene went. And hopefully when they come back in and see um, how good their dogs have been without their owners, because that's obviously what we've had to do um, during COVID is that we've had to have the dogs in um, and they've been brilliant. And most of them are just like, shouldn't say this but maybe better without their owners but they're just so happy to be here because they get lots of cuddles and they get lots of treats and they're really happy and okay I'll, end the, I'll fall asleep for five minutes and it's just fantastic it's it's a really good it's a feel good factor for the job as well and as you say if you walk at the way at the end of the dog at the end of the day and you see this big, nice big box and it's full of blood and it goes back to Loughborough saves so many dogs lives it's fantastic so I don't think we have any further questions and we are coming up to an hour, which is absolutely fantastic. So thank you, Helen, very much for taking the time to um, tell us all about Blood Bank. And uh, remind everybody that in two weeks time on the 27th of May, we're doing a similar thing, but to more the general public in order to spread the word, get those dogs in. Um, and we'll hopefully you'll be able to join us then. We really appreciate you all turning up this evening um, and we'll hopefully see you again soon.